as I was saying, it is. Warpo's Warpo Wednesday still, or moving into Thursday. It depends on which coast you're on. On the East Coast, it's Thursday at midnight. On the West Coast, it's still Warpo Wednesday, 9 p.m. And it's time for Dr. Hemmingson's News of the Weird and the Weirder. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, where do we start in all this weird news? I guess if you got a royal heart, you're timeless when it comes to getting the good burials. Now yeah, I hear a story called Heart of Louis the Seventeenth Kids. Royal Funeral. The heart of a uh, ten-year-old heir to Francis' throne was cut from his body when he died in prison. Pick pickled, stolen, returned, and DNA tested two centuries later. Why was he in prison at ten years old? Well, you know, these French people. Next week, Louis the Seventeenth's heart will be placed in France's royal crypt north of Paris. Now that the genetic study testing has been has persuaded many historians that the tiny little petrified heart is almost certainly the real thing. In ceremonies on Monday and Tuesday, European royalty will honor the little boy who became a pawn of the French Revolution, dying alone in a filthy prison. After a mass on Tuesday, his heart will be laid to rest at the Saint-Denis Basilica near the graves of his parents, Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth. The ceremonies recognizing the royal heart will close 200, no, 209 years of rumor, legend, and historical uncertainty surrounding the child's death. Many historians had insisted that the true heir escaped from the sickly boy who died and who died was a substitute. I would have liked to believe the story that the child survived. Prince Charles Emmanuel de Bourbon de Ponet, one of Louis the Seventeenth's closest living relatives, told a news conference, Today, science has proven the contrary. Louis the Seventeenth's short life was stuff of nightmares. He lost his parents to the guillotine. He was locked in Paris, the Paris Temple prison for three years. For part of that time, a solitary confinement in a darkened cell without anyone to wash him or clean him, said historian Philippe Darome. The boy finally died of tuberculosis in 1795, his body reportedly ravished by tumors and scabies. The child's corpse was dumped in a common grave, but, at fir but first a doctor secretly carved out his heart, in keeping with the tradition of preserving royal hearts separate from their bodies. The doctor smuggled it away in a handkerchief, and kept it as a curiosity, Del, Del Rome said in a telephone interview. Instantly, rumors spread that the true heir had been spirited away from the prison with a co commoner left in his place. It's a universal myth, the myth of the lost or hidden king, said Del Rome, whose research about Louis the Seventeenth led him to organize the DNA test in 2000. In all, in all civilizations, in all eras, there is this myth of people who have been hidden from us. Among the most persistent comes from Russia, where rumor has circulated for years that Nicholas II's youngest daughter, Anastasia, escaped the Bolshevik firing squad that killed the Tsar and his family. Two sets of remains from the, uh, from the family, Nicholas, his wife, and five other children, have never been found. Several people have since come forward claiming to be Anastasia, and many more have said they were Louis the Seventeenth. After the restoration of France's monarchy in 1814, about 100 people came forward claiming to be the prince. In places as far flung as the Seychelles, Dormé said, even a Wisconsin missionary who was part Native American claimed to have been the lost Dauphin, as Louis the Seventeenth was often called. In France, the doctor who had performed the boy's autopsy kept the heart in a crystal vase filled with alcohol on the shelf, a tantalizing souvenir for one of his students who stole it. 
Repenting on his deathbed, the thief asked his wife to give it back. After the restoration, the heart was offered to various members of the royal family and finally found its way to the Spanish brands of the Bobons. They returned to Paris in 1975 and has been, re and has been held since, since at the Basilica of St. Denis. But it was recognized as merely as the heart of the child who died in the prison, not necessarily that of the royal heir. Before the genetic test, many people simply couldn't believe the royal heart could have survived 200 years passing from person to person. But when scientists at two European universities compared DNA from the heart of the dead boy to the DNA from hair trimmed from Marie Antoinette during her childhood in Austria, the link was confirmed. The results left a few lingering skeptics to retort that the heart could have come from Louis the 17th brother who died in 1789. Historians say that's highly unlikely. The two hearts were not cut or embalmed in the same way. There will always be doubters. Louis the Seventeenth story was a horrible, horrible thing, and, and people preferred the happy ending, said Del Rame. He was a child whose life was stolen from him. Even his death was stolen from him. People just couldn't admit that they that he truly died in such an awful conditions. In the end, it would it 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 it, it, it is a wound in the history of France. And that's the story of the mysterious heart, a telltale heart of Louis the Third, seventeen. Now vindicated after two hundred ninety-nine years of pickled curiosity and mystery surrounding the truth. The DNA tells the truth. Poor kid, eh? Dying all alone up there in the prison after his mom, Marie Antoinette, was beheaded by the people of France. So, uh, what? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, uh, this is News of the Weird. This is not Sean David Morton's Strange Universe. Uh, Sean is, does his show on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. He takes Wednesdays off. On Wednesdays, I come on, because it's Warp Poet Wednesday, and do News of the Weird. So, uh, we cover some of the same stuff, but I'm just... I'm just not Sean. I, I can't fill his shoes. But, so keep that in mind. You should all, all you uh, Sean David Martin fans, you know that he takes Wednesdays off. Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, we have Strange Universe. On Wednesdays, we have News of the Weird. All right? All right. So, onward and, and forwards and upwards and downwards and and backwards. Something coming up about uh, James Holmes that I suspected probably would have happened. This story is coming out that Aurora Theater shooting suspect James Holmes has attempted suicide. It, apparently that uh, CBS4 in, in uh, Denver has learned from reliable law enforcement sources that James Holmes has made multiple suicide attempts in recent days and at least one attempt led to a brief hospitalization. Defense attorney for Holmes went to court Wednesday today to request a hearing for Holmes set for Thursday to be postponed but they were vague about precisely what happened. A public defender declined in court to say what was ailing Holmes. It's not as simple as a migraine she said. Uh, law enforcement contacts speaking on the condition. Oh my! Hang on, sorry, my page is jumping around here. Um, law enforcement contacts speaking on the condition of anonymity told CBS4 investigator Ryan Moss that Holmes 
jailhouse suicide attempts were viewed as being half-hearted with one of them involving him running into a wall in his jail cell, another involving him jumping off his bed. CBS 4 has learned that the hospital trip Tuesday was for diagnostic testing following one of the attempts reached by phone Wednesday afternoon. Our our RFO County Sheriff Grayson Robinson declined to confirm that report, citing an ongoing gag order in the Holmes case. Over prosecution objections, the judge went along with the defense notion to postpone the hearing until December 10th. Okay, I, 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 I've been feeling all along, and as well as others, that, that Mr. Holmes is going to mysteriously disappear or commit suicide or, or something will happen to him in, uh, in custody because there's no way he's going to court and that, that the truth of that story is going to ever come out. They'll just, uh, they'll just off him. You know they'll uh, they'll have a uh, they'll have a sort of a, a Jack Ruby sort of guy uh, uh, take him out. Um, so don't be uh, uh, too surprised if we eventually hear something about that or or you know that's just uh, I, I heard someone dinging me. Yes, Bongo, this is Warfo on the air. As I was saying, this is still Wharf Poe Wednesday. This is Dr. Hemmings' News of the Weird. It is not Sean David Martin's Strange Universe. Once again, Sean David Martin, the one and only, the Sean, is on tu- on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. He has always taken Wednesday off at this station and at that mysterious other station where he no longer is. He is now exclusive to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com because this is where he belongs. He's the man. He the man. And, I, and I'll be talking to Sean uh, live uh, probably Sunday at the Alchemy event. That's when he's doing his key speech thing. and uh, He'll come by the uh, Revolution Radio table and uh, Lorian or, and I will uh, or I will interview him or maybe uh, Jason will interview him um, somewhere live on the floor again alchemy event 2012 happening this weekend in Irvine at the Temple of Light 11 Goddard Street Friday Saturday and Sunday 9 to 5 p.m. be there be be square be one be all Uh, revolution radio will be there with a table at in the vendor area wherever that's going to be with Lorian Fenton Jason Bretwin and moi yours truly your one and only Worf Bo, Dr. Hemmingson Papa Hem Doc H okay so let's see what else is uh, what else is happening what else is happening so yeah, so so uh, don't be too surprised if we hear something happen to poor, poor Jason, Jason, James, James Holmes, our Patsy, the Aurora Patsy. But yeah, something weird here. Story: vegetative, pa- vegetative patient Scott Rootley says, "I'm not in pain." This is coming from the BBC. Says a Canadian man who is believed to have been in a vegetative state for more than a decade has been able to tell scientists that he was not in any pain. It's the first time an uncommunicative, severely brain injured patient has been give has been able to give answers clinically relevant to their care. A. Scott Rootley, thirty nine, was asked questions while having his brain activity scanned by an fMRI machine his doctor says the discovery means med- medical textbooks will need rewriting vegetative patients emerge from a coma into a condition where they have periods periods of awakeness with their eyes open but have no perception of themselves or the outside world 
Mr. Wootley suffered a severe brain injury in a car accident 12 years ago. None of his physical assessments since then have shown any sign of awareness or ability to communicate. But the British neuroscientist Professor Adrian Owen, who led the team at the Brain and Mind Institute, University of Western Ontario, A, said Mr. Rootley was clearly not vegetative. Scott has been able Scott has been able to show that he is conscious, thinking mind. We have scanned him several times and his pattern of brain activity shows he is clearly choosing to answer our questions. We believe he knows who and where he is, eh? Professor Owens said it was a groundbreaking moment, eh? Asking a patient something important to, the, to them has been our aim for many years. In future, we could ask what we could do to improve their quality of life. It could be simple things like the entertainment we provide or the three times a day they are washed and fed, eh? Scott, Rooley par Scott Rooley's parents say they always thought he was conscious and could communicate by lifting a thumb or moving his eyes, but this never been accepted by the medical staff. Professor Brian Young at the University Hospital of London, Mr. Rootley's neurologist for a decade, said the scan results overturned all the behavioral assessments that had been made over the years. I was impressed and amazed that was that he was able to show these cognitive responses. He had clinical picture of a typical he had the clinical picture of a typical vegetable patient, vegetative patient, and showed no response movements showed no spontaneous response movements that looked meaningful. Observational assessments of Mr. Rootley since he responded in the scanner have continued to suggest he is vegetative. Professor Young said medical textbooks would need to be updated to include Professor Owen's techniques. The BBC's parent panorama program followed several vegetative and minimally conscious patients in Britain and Canada for more than a year. Another Canadian patient, Stephen Graham, A, was able to demonstrate that he had laid down new memories since his brain injury. Mr. Graham answers yes when asked whether his sister had a daughter. His niece was born after his car accident five years ago. The panorama team also followed three patients at the Royal Hospital in, uh, for Neurodisability in Putney, which specializes in the real bit rehabilitation of brain injured patients. It corroborates with a team of Cambridge University neuroscientists at the Wolfson Brain Imaging Center in Underbrooks Hospital, Cambridge. One of the patients is diagnosed as vegetative by the RHN, and he's also unable to he was also unable to show awareness. A second patient who was not able to be f fully assessed by the RHN because of repeated sickness is later shown to have some limited awareness in brain scans. So interesting, interesting um, updates and for onward foreignness of modern medical science. But you know the Arcturians could easily communicate with anyone who's brain dead because the Arcturians are just cool in that way. I will report tomorrow if, you know, as as earlier when I, on The Art of Dreaming I was talking to the Arcturian group mind channeling through Dr. Susan Lee and they said that they would visit me in my dreams and also take me onto their ship tonight where I could go to the rejuvenation chamber and feel rejuvenated. So if I wake up bright, brightly and saying, I was on an Arcturian ship and it was wonderful, you'll know, we'll know, we'll all know that it was true. That what Dr. Susan Lee said as the Arcturians were talking to me on air, et cetera, et cetera. So I look forward to my uh, trip to the Arcturian ship. If they keep their word. And they're Arcturians now, so they should keep their word. Let's look at some other weird science. You need to play Oingo Boingo's weird science right now. Weird science. Do 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 do. Organ scientists make embryos with two women and one man. 
Scientists in Oregon have created embryos with genes from one man and two women using a provocative technique that could someday be used to prevent babies from inheriting certain rare incurable diseases. The researchers at Oregon Health and Science University said they are not using the embryos to produce children and it is not clear when or even if this technique will be put to use, but it has already stirred a debate over its risks and ethics in Britain, where scientists did some more work a few years ago. The British experiments reported in 2008 led to headlines about the possibility someday of babies with three parents, but that's an overstatement. The DNA from the second woman amounts to less than 1% of the woman of the embryo's genes, and it isn't the sort that makes a child look like mom or dad. The procedure is simply a way of replacing some defective genes that sabotage the normal working of cells. The British government is asking for a public comment on the technology before it decides whether to allow its use in the future. One concern it cites is whether such DNA alteration could be an early step down a slippery slope toward designer babies. Ordering up, say, a petite blue-eyed girl or a tall dark-haired young man yeah questions have also arisen about the safety of the technique not only for the baby who results from the egg but also for the child's decedents in june an influential british bioethics group concluded that the technology would be ethical to use if proven safe and effective an, ex an expert panel in Britain said in 2011 that there was no evidence the technology was unsafe but urged further study. Lori Zoloth, a bioethicist at Northern University in Evanston, Illinois, said in an interview that safety permit problems might not show up for several generations. She said she hopes the United States will follow Britain's lead in having a wide-ranging discussion of the technology. While the kind of diseases it seeks to fight can be terrible, this might not be the best way to address it, Zoloff said. Over the past few years, scientists have reported that such experiments produced healthy monkeys and that tests in human eggs showed encouraging results. The Oregon scientist reported Wednesday that they may have produced about a dozen early human embryos and found the techniques is highly effective replacing DNA. The genes they want to replace aren't the kind most people think of, which are found in the nucleus of cells and influence traits, traits such as eye color and height. Rather, the genes reside outside the nucleus in energy-producing structures called mitochondria. These genes are passed along by mothers, not fathers. About one in every 5,000 children inherits a disease caused by defective mitochondrial genes. The defects can cause many rare diseases with a host of symptoms including strokes, epilepsy, dementia, blindness, deafness, kidney failure, and heart disease. The new technique, if approved someday for routine use, would allow a woman to give birth to a baby who inherits her nucleus DNA but not her mitochondrial DNA. So here's how it'll work. Doctors would need unfertilized eggs from the patient of a healthy donor. They would remove the nucleus DNA from the donor eggs and replace it with nucleus DNA from the patient's eggs. So they would end up with eggs that have the most prospective mother's nucleus DNA but the donor's healthy mitochondrial DNA. In a report published online Wednesday, uh, that was actually last Wednesday, by the journal Nature uh, Sukrat Matilopov and others at Ohio State University reports transplanting nucleus DNA into 64 unfertilized eggs from healthy donors. After fertilization, 13 eggs, 13 eggs showed normal development and went on to form early embryos. The researchers also reported that four monkeys born in 2009 from eggs that had DNA transplants remain healthy, giving some assurance on safety. Mel Metalopov said, in an interview that the researchers hope to get federal support and approval to test the procedure in women, but 
that current restrictions on using federal money on human embryo research stand in the way of such studies. The research was funded by the university and by the Leduc Foundation in Paris. Dr. Douglas Turnbull of Newcastle University in Britain, whose team has transplanted DNA between eggs using different techniques, called the new research very important and encouraging in showing that such transplants could work. But clearly, safety is an issue with other techniques if it is to be applied by humans, he said. Okay, as I was reading this story, two things went through my mind, actually several things. A story that I could write, and that this stuff is already, this is just old, old science. We know that the secret black ops government has already been making super soldiers and other kinds of people in this sort of manner. This also sounds like how uh, the Greys do their sort of human hi human alien hybrid uh, techniques. We do know from many accounts that the Greys, sometimes our friends the reptilians, uh, harvest eggs from human females and they take the eggs and they inject a uh, nucleus from uh, their kind, a gray or a reptilian, or a mantoid, insectoid, or whatever. Replant the egg into the female, remove the fetus at about two or three months to put it into an incubator, and then they grow themselves some nice little hybrids. Um, so a lot of ethical questions in, in doing this, but you know, uh, most likely it's you know nine times out of ten it's already being done, has been done, and uh, so would we you know if if we do start doing designer children and say uh, you take the mitochondrial DNA of uh, two other females, so basically maybe the child has the uh, DNA from three mothers and one father, do the uh, mitochondrial DNA donor mothers have any legal standpoint, any legal position to ask for custody of that child. There's a there's a, a novel by Robert Silverberg, science fiction novel that he published in uh, 1968, I believe, called uh, Thorns. And there's a, there's a, a young woman in it who uh, had some sort of special sort of DNA and the government takes her and they harvest a, a hundred of her eggs and, and create these various hybrid children and she has like a psychic connection to them all and it's, it's kind of strange so interesting story nonetheless nevertheless be my be my mitochondrial baby baby hey want to have a mitochondrial child with me? Three ladies? You know, that's what you do when you walk up, walk up to say three women in a bar, you know, they're standing around, you go, hey, let's the four of us, never mind, uh, get into that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I. Well, 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 William Tell. So, onwards, what else? Do you have any more weird science news going on? Yeah, we do, actually. We have. Is this weird? This is weird science. Uh, Danes develop eye control software for phones and tablets. Yeah, here, this is some research uh, going on to uh, uh, software where you could uh, operate your uh, phone and tablet or maybe your uh, internet glasses with eye movement um, this is coming from the uh, Ameri or, uh, AFP uh, this story is actually a, a couple weeks old, I meant to read it before but I didn't, but it's still pertinent a Danish company like anything good comes out of there hopes to clinch deals with major mobile phone and tablet makers after developing software that enables users to control their devices by moving their eyes 
You could use the, for basic controls such as turning to the next page in an ebook and playing games with your eyes. Chief executive and co-founder of the I Tribe, Soon Ersup Johansson, said, "The software uses infrared light reflected from the pupil of the eye, which is recorded by the device's camera, enabling users to scroll or click on the screens with their eyes." When you are reading an ebook and get to the bottom of the page, the software will know to turn the next page, or if you look away from the screen, it will dim it. The iTribe is made up of four PhD students who founded the company a year ago. They received $800,000 or 615,000 euros in funding in August to develop the technology. Their company, the company plans to release the technology at no cost to other software developers early next year. Uh, so it's going to be uh, freeware, I guess. And then uh, other developers will uh, continue on with the, uh, with it, you know, in the uh, freeware sort of fashion. Uh, we are, or what, 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 what do you call freeware? Um, um, I guess you just call it freeware, huh? Uh, we do not intend to develop all apps ourselves. We are allowing the software community to develop the apps, he said. Erstep Johansson said, iTribe aims to get their software integrated in the hardware of big tablet producers so consumers can buy a tablet with the software and then download apps that run with the iControl technology. The iTribe aims to earn money from lic licensing fees from companies producing the, the hardware or platforms such as Apple, Samsung, Google, or Microsoft. Cameras on current mobile devices still need to, to be connected to a small unit with an infrared camera to work with the software, but, Erst but Alstrup Johansson said next generation devices would very likely be able to use the software. At the moment, if people want to use the software, they need an additional device that has either been added to a current smartphone or tablet or a new hardware device that is not yet on the market, he said. The technology is expected to significantly change the way users play games and use apps. Said Paul, said John Pauline Hansen, a former PhD supervisor with the co with the four co-founders. I am convinced that it will radically change things. It will be completely hands-free interaction with mobile devices. He said, the most interesting effect will be for all kinds of games, education, and entertainment purposes. He said, adding that disabled people would also benefit greatly. Well, you know, a Google and Apple have already said uh, in the next couple of years they're going to have the uh, the internet glasses the Google 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 local whatever um, you know these these are our glasses uh, these are glasses that uh, you know that you could uh, connect online to and and uh, read your email through your through the glasses viewfinder or whatever S and using your eye eye to track things and stuff so you know that this is coming soon to a uh, consumer store near you in the next couple of years they, they, I mean they already have the technology it's just not uh, feasible yet with uh, for the consumer market but I'm waiting to get my uh, my Google glasses and my, my uh, or my Apple my Apple eye I as we'll call it the eye the Apple eyeball, I, I, I look or something. I look, yeah. Damn, I need to uh, hire myself out to Google to be a sort of like marketing guy. Yeah, think so. The I, I. Um, yeah, the eyewear, the optical sexiness of the I, I. And we'll also have. Angela Black designing backpacks for cockroaches. Since she she's all into the backpack cockroaches as well as the GMO MK Ultra mosquito. Okie doke. We also have here's a story. For some reason I didn't get to couple weeks ago, but it sounds pretty interesting. World's oldest new dad is 96. 
Indian man met his 52-year-old wife 10 years ago, and now they have a new baby. He could be a great-great-grandfather, but at 96, an Indian man is the world's oldest new dad. Ramjit Raghav and his 52-year-old wife, Shakunatala Devi, gave birth to their second son on, on October 5th, according to the Times of India. He met Devi 10 years ago after practicing a life of celibacy. Okay, wait a minute. Let me, let me read that again. He met Devi 10 years ago after practicing a life of celibacy. Okay, so this guy was celibate up till age 86, and now he's catching up, I guess. Says, uh, my neighbors are jealous, and they keep asking me for my secret, but all I tell them that it is God's will, Raghiv is quoted to saying, according to newsmen. I think, it's, I think it is very important for a husband and a wife to have sex regularly, and when she asks, I will go all night. <laughs> but for the sake of my child, I put our needs aside for now. A field hand and former wrestler, he first broke the world's oldest new dad record when his first son was born in November 2010, when he was 94. He lives on a diet of milk, butter, and almonds. Although Rag Raghav believes he's very capable of having more babies, he says he's done for financial reasons. Well, I, more power to you. Dude, 96. Sexual dynamo creating babies out there. Like a rabbit. But why was he celibate for 86 years? Oh, we don't want to speculate about that. I say, go for it, dude. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm the one to talk, I guess. Oh... Um, what else have we got here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's here? Uh, moving onward. Sex surrogates are growing in popularity. This is coming from CBS Miami. Sex therapists in South Florida say they are seeing an increasing number of patients using sexual surrogates to overcome intim intimacy and performance problems. As well, they should talk to Raghav in India. I mean, he, he's, the, he's at the top there, man. The sex surrogate is, licensed, is a licensed counselor who works with single people suffering from sexual problems to overcome their issues, often by serving as a surrogate to allow them to practice overcoming the sexual issue they are used to trying to overcome. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people, uh, uh, not a lot of people, but some people say a sex surrogate is nothing more than a prostitute with a license. Right? You're going to sex surrogate, you're paying her, usually, or him, uh, uh, sex therapy. Or, uh, as, as some, some, uh, some call girls say, you know, they're providers. But a sex, a sex surrogate has a license to cha-cha-cha. And usually they also uh, have a doctorate in psychology. So, it's a taboo, taboo topic, but it shouldn't be said. Miami sex therapist Dr. Sonia Kenya. The controversial therapy using sex surrogates is in the national spotlight as there is a new movie heading to the theaters on the issue called The Sessions, which opens uh, soon in South Florida theaters, chronicles the story of a disabled man who enlists the services of a sexual surrogate to learn how to be intimate with a sex partner despite his physical limitations. Dr. Sonia Kenya said sexual surrogates working with patients in South Florida are helping adults to, with autism, wounded warriors, and midlife virgins. What? Uh, helping adults with autism, wounded warriors, and midlife virgin, virgins. The 40-year-old virgin, right? Steve, Steve Carell? Uh, they're, they're professional and successful in every other capacity of their life but they've never hugged anyone intimately or been massaged without all their clothes off or walked down the street holding someone's hand, Kenya said. God, that's really sad. I mean, I, mean, I guess there's people out there like that, that, you know, they reach a certain age and they've never hugged anyone or been massaged or, 
or what? Hold someone's hand in public, which you know, some people get offended by that. You know, the the PD PD uh, A uh, public display of affection, not not personal data device or whatever, um, or or a PDF. Uh, anyway, I have my 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 theories on people who hate to see PDAs, public displays of affection, because what they're seeing, they really want, but they don't have. And so they get all uppity about it. Man, that's just not appropriate for public display. Because I want it. Right? South Florida sex therapist says Dr. Marlon Volker says uh, this isn't for someone who is bored in their sex life and looking to bump things up. Boom, 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 boom. She said this therapy, which is perfectly legal in Florida, helps people with terrible performance anxiety, horrible past experiences of rape, and incest, and even adults with little or no sexual experience. Dr. Kenya said surrogates are also working with transgender people in South Florida. People who have transitioned from one sex to another, they've undergone a new gender assignment. They may use a surrogate to be comfortable now having sex in their new body. Clones. Dr. Volker said she was a sexual surrogate working with disabled people 35 years ago. She said most therapists will recommend a surrogate to a client. However, it's up to the client and the surrogate if they wish to proceed. It's up to the patient and surrogate to set a program with a start and stop date. It's important to point out both parties can stop at any time, Volker said. Therapists said surrogate sessions are often, often happen in patients' homes. Oftentimes, it's going to someone's place of residence and being sexually intimate with someone even without the physical act, said Dr. Kenya. There are many other activities involved in successful intimate relationship and surrogate practice and all those. Uh, there's a lot, blah, blah, blah. Well, basically, I guess uh, sexual surrogates in Florida and elsewhere are having a boom in business in 2012. Of course, running through to my mind is using clones. What if you got a clone of a supermodel? Now, oh, never mind. I'll write a story about it. So, uh, you know, that's going on. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on up. Yes. People in the chat. This is Dr. Hemmingson's Wednesday Night News of the Weird. As always. Been doing this for months. And, uh, part of Wolf Poe Wednesday. And, uh, not Sean, not Sean David Martin's Strange Universe, which runs Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Coming up, at, uh, after, after me is, uh, the round table with Earthplay, I believe. Yes, Earthplay will be hosting the round table in 13 minutes. And we'll have to see what Earthplay has to say about all the things that he covers out there in the world of astronomy. And then after that, I believe, is uh, uh, Seth Michaels. He will be doing his show, Second Foundation. Last week, I was uh, on Second Foundation with uh, Seth and uh, Comet. We were talking about Alistair Crowley, Luciferianism, black magic, and the left-hand path. It was an interesting show. I don't know why it didn't get recorded. I don't see it on the archives. It was pretty fascinating. And uh, I think many people found it to be such. Unfortunately, I tried to record it, and I did it wrong. Ah! A giraffe story. Well, we've all heard of the, of the Vinged Zaraf. The story here coming from um, Huffington Post. Armstrong Biley, the good giraffe, does good deeds all over Scotland. Armstrong Biley is sticking his neck out for a good cause. Twice a week for the past six months, the 32-year-old Scotland native has dressed up in, a, in an elaborate homemade giraffe costume and carried out random acts of kindness, the BBC reports. 
and there's a photo of him in his giraffe costume. Um, I want to post this in chat because you all, you all, you all, you all, all you alls got to see this. All you all, you ought to see this. And then he just needs some wings, and he would be the winged giraffe. Yes, yes. So let me post the link to that story. We're all Palladians. I have met Palladians. I I could I could actually I the Palladian I met I was not tall, blonde, like many of the Nordics are. But I already talked about that. So anyway, uh, uh backwards uh onwards, uh calling himself the Good Giraffe, Belayli has cleared up litter, handed out free coffee, claimed cleaned animal shelter cages, and even bought gifts for needy children. I give out cards with my phone number and ask people to text me ideas, the good giraffe told the Indenburg Evening, Evening News. He said the idea first came to him when he happened upon a man in a gorilla suit playing the drums. I decided to get my own costume. God, I can't do a Scottish accent. I, hey, Captain, give me a light. I decided to get my... Eh, never mind. I decided to get my own costume, he told the paper. But I went for a giraffe as it's my favorite animal. I think it suits my personality, too. My head is in the clouds, but my heart is in the right place. The good giraffe has been spotted only in his home city of Dundee, but also in Aberdeen, Stonehaven, Forfar, and Black Isle, Indenburg, and Gla Glasgow. Bailey is currently unemployed, but busks with his kazoo and tajambi drum in order to raise money for his good deeds. It would be good to get sponsors so I could make this my full-time occupation. He told the Huffington Post in the United Kingdom last week, the good giraffe started a blog detailing his adventures and invites readers to comment and suggest more good deeds. Now let's go to his blog. His blog is good, ja good giraffe, excuse me, one word, goodgiraffe.wordpress.com. Let me post that in the chat if you all would like to read the Good Giraffe blog. Mr. Good Giraffe, I am going to suggest that he gets himself some wings so that he can become the Good wing Winged Giraffe. Yes. Yes. The Winged Giraffe. The Good Winged Giraffe with the cape. We'll send him a cape. We'll get Vasto to send him a cape. Or Tones. Tones and Vasto can send the good giraffe a cape to help in his efforts to be a good giraffe. So, uh, looking at his blog, yeah, he's, he's wandering around. Oh, there's even a... Uh, I don't know, that's not him on that YouTube thing. Alright, so, uh, so, obviously, there is a... Oh, here's a... Here's a there is a YouTube video of the good giraffe on a bus. Obviously, there's a popularity in the whole giraffe thing. As we see. Giraffes are the new the new, uh, the new monkey. Um, hmm. Hmm. Let's see. What, what, what time we have here? Well, let's end on this note. The weird sex lives of U.S. presidents. Was John F. Kennedy a kinky guy? So this story says, the four most impressively weird sex lives of U.S. presidents. Coming from Cracked.com. When you come become president, something in your brain snaps. You're a normal person for a while, and then... As soon as you take your oath of you know, on inauguration day, that part of your brain that normally makes sure you don't get too weird with sex collapses in on itself, and a new game begins. The rules are different. And it's just not about infidelity, which at least Jefferson, Harding, FDR, JFK, LBJ, and Clinton were guilty of. And not just about regular, regular having sex outside which John Quincy, without a doubt, our ugliest president Adams, was guilty of. 
This is the weird stuff. Number four. The top four. And going up to bot to top. Number four. Lyndon Johnson. Accidental pimp. Until the people who run the Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park respect many petitions and uh, allow the digging up of LBJ's corpse, we'll never know how officially, how big his, well, you know, why it was. So we'll just have to take his word for it. Johnson's word was that he was a man, a huge man, a man of girth and length. Always jealous of the attention that Kennedy got for his sexual escapades, Johnson was never shy about waving his wiener around and telling anyone who would listen that I've had more women by accident than Kennedy had on purpose. Who knew LBJ went down that road? He used his giant presidential statute for things he would assume he'd use it for, but also some surprising things as well, according to biographer Jack Dalek. At one point during his presidency, Johnson met with a reporter who repeatedly asked him why American troops were in Vietnam. Frustrated, Johnson unzipped his pants, pulled out his quote-unquote substantial organ, and shouted, That is why! The craziest part of the story, which itself is nothing but pure poop-eating crazy stuff, is that it worked. That answer satisfied the reporter like, Oh yeah, when you put it that way, sure, of course we're in Vietnam. Huh. We should all be, we should be in all countries. I'd be starting a war in space if I had one like that. <laughs> Is this for real? Number three, Ulysses S. Grant is proudly not naked. As bad as he was, President Grant was kind of a prude when it came to public nudity. Even though he expected his men to fight and die for him, he refused to shower in front of them. He was the only man who would take his morning showers in the privacy of his tent because, well, we don't know. Grant didn't want any of his men to see him naked. All the other soldiers would shower outside together, bonding, swapping stories about how horrible the war is while desperately trying to avoid accidentally looking at each other's butts. And Grant would just hide in his tent, hellbent on making sure that no one saw him Hilariously stupid looking. Maybe he was not as great as Lyndon Johnson. You might think that Grant was hiding his genitals because he wanted to create distance between himself and his men. It's not unreasonable to assume that he kept himself separate so he could always hold himself up as an authority figure. He's just not one of the guys. He's the boss. But you'd be wrong. It just wasn't his fellow men that Grant hid himself from. It was everyone. Late into his 60s, he bragged that no one had seen him naked since he was a child, not even the nurses. And, oh, we didn't get to uh, Kennedy and the other ones. Oh, well, that's at crack.com if you want to read the story. This has been Dr. Hemmingson's News of the Weird and the Weirder. Up next, Roundtable with your host, Earth Play. And after that, Seth Michaels, Second Foundation. This is Dr. Hemmingson signing off. Good day.